So we actually, I have, I'm teaching a grad seminar right now called Art and Labor. Um, many of the students are here. And we read, the first text we read was your text, um, humans, the ready-made artist and the human striving. It was a very productive conversation. But one of the questions that got raised was really about um, audience. And it made me think when you were talking about the light, the igniting of the map and how that was done in private, wasn't a public performance. It just made me think about the different audiences that you might have, the different kinds of publics that you seek to address. And I was hoping you could talk a little bit about that, about the question of audience and the, the multiplicity, I guess, of audience, and especially how the fact that you work in so many different mediums means that sometimes those audiences are quite diverse. So a text might circulate in a grad seminar, and, but then there might also be an installation in an art fair, you know, and those things might, um, those audiences might be kind of disjunctive. The second question is a question about your, well, um, I want to think a little bit more about that trash can, the transparency of the trash can, that actually was really kind of beautiful in a way. I mean, there was a kind of luminosity to it, and the, um, Something, something quite um, unexpected and lovely. Um, and I'm just wondering if you maybe could say a few words about your relationship to the aesthetic, sort of the kind of surplus of the aesthetic and how you think about form. And then finally, I uh, really um, <coughs> was intrigued by the double nature of the word redemption, obviously, so not only redeeming something, but also it's you know the notion of salvation. And I wondered if you could speak a little bit about your um, concept of optimism, I guess, which is something that also came up in our discussion of the human strike. Yes, another um, question. Uh, so, um, regarding the public, maybe uh, we are really the wrong people to ask because we uh, we don't have a very clear feedback on how our work is received or how it circulates. With text, it's much slower than uh, with the visual work. Uh, uh, because uh, it takes a long time to be digested, it takes a long time to circulate. Uh, we have uh, even noticed that uh, a text can have uh, a reception time of 10 years. <laughs> During 10 years it gets read and digested and all of a sudden people talk about it. So it's a, an extremely slow um, process and um, and uh, I would say that yeah, for the artwork it's, it's it's faster. Uh, it's faster because uh, probably there is an immediacy to, to what we see also. We go see a show and uh, we've been timing also how many people spend in exhibition spaces or in, in uh, places where videos are screened and it's really depressing. I mean, it's uh, around two minutes uh, if somebody is really interested. And, uh, but when we time ourselves, we do the same. So. Uh, it's something that should be uh, also questioned, like how well, how much people get to know the work, and actually what we understand is that paradoxically, uh, we all encounter uh, works in their uh, reproduction form. So uh, in books, catalogs, and that's where we engage the most with them and we spend uh, the most time with them. So, uh, it's, it's a very strange thing, the reception of the work. Uh, and I would say very, very simply that for us, uh, each work creates its own audience because uh, uh, they're very, uh, the audience of a work is, is, uh, is always uh, unpredictable and, and the way it's going to travel, the meaning, how it's going to be interpreted, how it's going to be misinterpreted. There's not much that the artist can do about it. Uh, not that we particularly want to, because the work is alone, it's like a text one cannot accompany anymore once you use the world. So there is a, a necessary abandonment of, of the thing. Uh, and we, we really know very little, but we are confident that each work creates its own audience in different moments of time in history, too, if it has the chance to survive uh, its contemporaries. Um, the second question was about... Uh, the aesthetic, yeah, that's a tricky one. Uh, well, we uh, obviously uh, think a lot about the form of the work, but we, we cannot associate the thinking that we do uh, on the form from the thinking that we do on the content. Or let's say that we have an idea 
uh, and then it can take uh, an extremely long time before translating into a form that is satisfactory. Uh, but the idea and its form somehow go absolutely together uh, because there is uh, no possible way that we, the fact of being more than one helps uh, because one has to agree on on how uh, on the work being strong enough and to, to be actually abandoned exactly to, to do this thing that I was talking about before and um, and I, I think that yeah the, the uh, it's never innocent how, how things are presented but it's never innocent how people present themselves so uh, we can either decide to be in a completely paranoid and anxious uh, posture about this uh, but we can also think that um, visibility is, is an, an aesthetic and ethic and political kingdom and space and so that what we do uh, has a meaning. It doesn't only create uh, this uh, retinal uh, reception and it's not, uh, it doesn't necessarily become superficial because it is visual. That's what we really believe. So we, we are not against uh, the work uh, occasionally looking beautiful or, or being seductive. We think it's, it's part of our practice and we don't do this uh, to uh, uh, to prostitute ourselves. We do this because we think there is, there is some intensity, some uh, importance in, in this beauty when it's reached, when we have the luck and the chance of reaching it. And regarding the optimism, well, I don't know. We, we, uh, uh, we obviously uh, are convinced that uh, there is uh, uh, energy uh, around, that we live in a very interesting time and that the system that we live under cannot continue working the way it works for a very long time because many things have appeared in their, in their raw brutality and corruption is, is absolutely revolting and, and, uh, and it's reached uh, incredible, incredible peaks and we've seen that the democracy doesn't prevent it. So uh, we, we are pretty hopeful that, uh, uh, that there are possibilities uh, of, uh, of living together in better ways. We, we, we are really convinced of this. Is your collaboration meant to be one of those, meant to model that in some way? No, I guess nothing of what we do is, is a model of anything. <laughs> That's something that we maintain, uh, including the talks and the presentation. We're never happy with it, so we always experiment and keep trying. Uh, new formats, but no, and, and again, coming back to the notion of human strike, I don't think our work is a, an example of human strike. We don't work uh, in any form of paradigm or example, we're not exemplary in any possible way. But there is this trick that when one shows something, especially on a big screen, and says, This is what I do, it inevitably looks exemplary, or even the exhibition space has this. this uh, uh, nature that it looks like, look, that's how things should be done. But it's absolutely not like that. We, or we consider that everything we do is experimental. And we actually are working very much on this notion of abstraction because we think that um, the political changes that will, will uh, come up in the next years uh, will, uh, will be uh, the children of uh, uh, some type of abstract politics because reproducing and representing uh, no longer works as a, as a system uh, in, in art as much as in politics. And so, yeah, we've been working on some record and uh, I guess we have a, a book that should come out soon, but uh, I don't know what the graphic designer is doing in the uh, British uh, publishing house called Meta Mute, and it's going to be accessible online. So uh, I think it's called Human Strike has already begun and other texts. And so in this book, there is this text where we start working on this idea of, uh, of abstraction as some record presents it, but uh, with uh, possible implications for art and politics. That was very helpful. I have a lot of follow-up questions, but I want to um, also give my collaborators a chance to respond. Hi. I, I'm just encountering your work, so I, I, have, I don't have a wide context, but one of the things that um, was really intriguing me, um, particularly in the first two pieces, had to do with this whole notion of the ready-made and its history and how, um, you know, it's functioned in uh, modern and contemporary art and the way in which this gets brought, these ready-mades in, in this work.
are, uh, are still being brought into the museum or into the gallery space, and that part of its charge has something to do with its placement in that, which the references back to Duchamp and, and so on. And so, in what ways has this notion of uh, the ready-made sort of transformed itself in the modern context? And I was sort of thinking that uh, we now think of that in an earlier moment, ready-mades were about a certain kind of re-enchantment, uh, a way of thinking. Now, because we're environmentally concerned in some ways, that uh, ready-mades have something to do with recycling and, and sort of rethinking uh, waste and so on. But yet, the, 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 the gallery or the museum still is the locus of this sort of energy, and I'm, I'm wondering, you know, is that what constitutes ready-made? Is it its relation to the art space? I mean, is there a way of rethinking the ready-made that sort of opens up other, you know, kinds of uh, spaces for aesthetic uh, experience or knowledge? So maybe you could talk a little bit about how you're thinking about it. Sure, I'm, I'm fascinated by this idea of the ready-made and the recycling, ready-made and the sort of uh, um, environmental friendly um, practice. It's, uh, it, it's something we never thought about, but um, uh, definitely there is, a, there is still, according to us, a, a certain percentage of, uh, of enchantment in this transubstantiation. Uh, that makes uh, some uh, vulgar object into uh, into an artwork, but we are interested in the implications, or the political implications of this of this action, actually, because uh, uh, as we were saying yesterday in the conversation with Jason Smith, now when one rescues an object from the, the vulgar kingdom of the useful uh, daily objects and transforms it into an artwork. The objection, the general objection, is always like, oh, now it's worth a lot of money because it's become an artwork. But it's not at all. I mean, it's just it, they they can only see. Most people can only see uh, very cynically this kind of uh, uh, transformation of, uh, of a vulgar object into an expensive object through this uh, arbitrary gesture of the artist. But it's uh, I guess I guess for the it was exactly the opposite. Uh, it was really uh, some uh, magic operation of, of uh, uh, infusing life into something that was just a dead commodity, a dead uh, thing. And, and I think this is what we are really interested in. And, uh, and redemption is, this installation is an example of that, I, I would say. Uh, but uh, the, the idea is, is really, I don't know, there's a text uh, we, uh, we wrote. Um, a while ago about the genealogy of, of the concept of ready-made where we use ultra deck as, as an example of it where ultra deck is this very disturbing uh, creature that has a life but is inanimated at the same time and the family man that is uh, uh, really uh, the, the, the economic life form is scared that it could uh, stumble in between the feet of his children on the staircase and bring with it this kind of uh, uh, terrible uh, feelings and terrible possibility of, 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 uh, uh, of yeah, of basically uh, attacking the, the system of, of usefulness and, uh, and bringing something else in the world and use value. Uh, this is what Audrey Lecla is, this body, but it, it can be used for anything. It's a very disquieting object because one doesn't know what, what is it for? But, but it has a presence, but it is intriguing, and obviously this is the danger of, of art that the family man fears in, in order that besides other things. So we, yeah, we use this as an example of how we feel about this operation. Does it, do the ready-mades, in your opinion, do they still have the sort of same political potential or, you know, uh, energy that they did at an earlier moment. I mean, we, we, I mean, they, and, and I'm just thinking about this idea that the in, of the bottles and the ways in which you know it brings this whole question of waste and so on into the art context. But 
is there something else that we, you know, sort of, that, that, that's doing? Well, I don't know, because we have used this notion of ready-made and extended it to, um, to the field of subjectivity today, because uh, uh, the world is definitely much more fabricated and much more mass-produced than it was uh, when Duchamp came up w w with the ready-made. Uh, inevitably, I mean, we are in, like, another, uh, really another era, but uh, uh, w what interests us is the uh, is the mass production of uh, subjectivity. For example, the system of the art school that produces every year uh, hundreds and hundreds of, uh, of potential artists. Not everybody uh, can, in the end, become an artist, but uh, there is a training. There is a specific training uh, internationally uh, established, and people get uh, um, confronted uh, with uh, a certain amount of references, a certain amount of uh, uh, concepts and notions, and, uh, and well, then uh, the internet and the other uh, media that we have allow us to access the, the forms and the, I mean the magazines do still work very very strongly, I believe, in terms of shaping the imagination of, of students and uh, and young people that are interested in art. And so inevitably, um, this idea of uh, uh, creativity, stimulating creativity. One has to sit in one studio and make art in art school and present stuff like on a on a timer, and it's 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 just this uh, application of uh, of the productive uh, system to to the to the art system, to the ed educational system. So uh, this idea of the ready-made artist is really uh, it's. It's not moral in any possible way, nor moralistic, even less so. But it's this fact that we are all produced to to be that, and uh, uh, and we are all somehow basic and, and vulgar subjectivities that are there to do the job of this romantic and and uh, uh, and kind of yeah this this space of uh, of projections that is the subjectivity of the artist, which is. Uh, this, this is a major shift. I think this is a big change because of uh, because of how the art world has changed, how the the market has entered it and disrupted it, uh, and because of the indistinction, the the potential indistinction between uh, museums and, and galleries and the marketplace and the art space. They are all places to look at art. Art is uh, proliferating in in, a, in an equally lively way in these different contexts, and it's it's very puzzling. But that's the world we're living in. There's no safe heaven, so that's also why things are gonna change because there's no space for withdrawal. Everything is contaminated by the commodity and by uh, this objectification. So, okay. so um, hi. I have a, uh, well, I have a, a bunch of questions, and I'm trying to make sure that they don't turn into really long questions. But I mean, one would probably goes with what extends what you were just talking about um, about how there's no um, place. Some other things that you said at other times that there's no place of purity from which you can take a stand, um, and that um, that that it would be sort of false consciousness to pretend you can have a kind of position outside the thing that's taking, etc. And that's been a kind of move that a number of artists. Are, are part of a you know a large coalition of, of people who who sort of take that view, and I think that there can be um, there's something you know philosophically so important about the view that there's no place outside, and at the same time, some might argue that it can rationalize a kind of participation in institutions that one critiques that can become kind of precious or cozy, um, rather than um, in the face of you know criticality being impossible. And it doesn't seem like you are, it seems in many ways that you're trying to avoid that as well. Um, and I wondered if you wanted to talk more about uh, impurity and... Sure. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, we, we, uh, we start from this uh, idea that there, there is no right context in either of the work. So uh, uh, from there, uh, on once the work is uh, strong enough, as, as I was saying before, to, to confront the world, to be in the world, uh, it, it can circulate uh, wherever it goes. And of course, the, the work can, can be bought 
uh, it can be acquired and one can find it in some uh, rich person's house. Uh, so this is one of the possibilities for the work. But what we've seen in these years is that some works can resist uh, the, um, the destiny of, uh, of recuperation and destruction. They're not uh, terrified that like the situation is where of being recuperated because uh, uh, it's, it's something that just doesn't make any sense today. This mythology of the avant-garde as, uh, as something uh, uh, that is supposed to, uh, to provide uh, an example, this exemplarity uh, is, is something that is profoundly reactionary and profoundly patriarchal too in many possible ways. And so uh, we've seen once that in, in, a, uh, in a very in an incredible uh, collector's house, uh, there was uh, uh, there was a work by um, Sergei Jensen. These people have been collectors for three generations, and it, it was uh, 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 not a very large painting. And it was one of these works made with um, old fabric uh, consumed, and, uh, and it really completely felt like a beggar in that space. It was it created this aura of sadness and all these other things that were beautiful and made to be beautiful and decorative and uh, uh, and just uh, yeah just enhance the, the wealth and the power of the people that they that bought them essentially and uh, there is, there is uh, I, I believe there is a, a capacity of the world to fight this a capacity of the world to to bring up uh, things in, in the worst context and in the worst place uh, and uh, and I I think that's why one shouldn't fear impurity because uh, because one needs to remain connected to this potentiality and it's also a better place to be in terms of uh, uh, not getting depressed because uh, it provides people with um, uh, with an energy to, to, to stay alive and to, to focus to uh, uh, on things that are real and they are healthy and to a certain extent. That's uh, what, what I really want to say in the talk, uh, the conversation we had with Howard Foster at some point at the beginning of our um, the stay in San Francisco uh, three months ago now in the CCA, uh, at some point uh, came up this uh, question on the uh, use value of culture because we always insist on the use value of culture, not only the use value of, of the work, which is something that somehow uh, is in contradiction with the idea of the ready-made, because the ready-made is a defunctionalization, but we always try to, to, uh, uh, to work in this, in this strange space between the functionalization and possibility of still being functional uh, on a metaphorical level or on a practical level of our work. And so, uh, yeah, just, just to say that there, there is a use value of culture which is to make life possible. Some references and uh, some uh, uh, concepts and some ideas allow us to to, uh, to to have a meaningful life. Can I just ask something then? Because that those thoughts in mind, say, connecting them back to the work that you showed us. Um, so I want, I don't know how much this was part of what you um, intended to be part of the in interior of the work, but at one point with redemptions, you talked about how the bottles will come came from a de redemption center and that they will go back to a redemption center <coughs> and I wondered about that uh, structure being how much you think of that as part of the interior of the work part of the work that fact that you have that arrangement versus other places <coughs> where you might have some kind of reference or expropriation or appropriation of, of, of a form from another sector and not make that arrangement um, and how that might relate to what you just said. Um, do, do you, was that part of what you thought you were doing? Was uh, making was was having some kind of was there a different kind of connection with the um, with the, the recycling redemption sector of the world that is similar to or slightly different than what you're doing when you're using um, indexes from the prison industrial context? Well, in the case of the can, we would have loved to be able to work with the more artisanal people that are kind of 
the rug pickers that get the can mm -hmm. on, a, on a much smaller scale. Yeah. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, it was completely impossible. At some point, we really wanted to transform the space in a sort of redemption center where these people could come uh -huh. and handle uh -huh. the, the cans. Yeah, because it's, I mean, in San Francisco, a lot, a lot of people do mm -hmm. this job. And, um, mm -hmm. uh, but, but it was technically impossible because the show is only up for a very short time. Uh -huh. and, um, uh, and, uh, and we cannot, we could not do it. So we had to uh, source the cans from the actual mm -hmm. election center and source it them from the smaller I was wondering who collected them. And was, yeah. Did you buy them from the redemption center? We did center not. The, the, the what is the, yes. So they were, so they, people had collected them, turned them into the redemption center, and then they bought the cans. Yes. Yeah. And then they'll return them. And they return them, yes. They will send them back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so in the course of putting together a work like that, you're figuring out pragmatically what the, how, what, what could be imagined and then having to place limits on what's that, what you're about to yeah, of course, and and, uh, and also the work, uh, as much as America burned and burned, is going to be destroyed. Mm -hmm. The work doesn't have the life after yeah. this, after the exhibition somehow. So it remains like an image, like a memory. Uh, it, it doesn't have a vocation to uh, fetishize the material that is made. <coughs> so that's why this, this suspension in the space is also suspension in time. Uh, and there is this idea of limbo that is very present in, in the work. But, uh, do, you, do you worry about the documentation of those works being always the fire images? I mean, it seems like all the burn images that I saw have all been the ones where, even though it's supposed to be the private, you know, Oh, no, 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 we, I've shown some, uh, uh, some pictures of the Ignite, the, like the... the, the I'm just saying online, some of the other work well, because pictures people you've done, do, people, people love those. Online, yeah, yeah, the stuff people love those. more exciting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. But it's just, yeah, because fire has this kind of yeah. Uh, yeah. very uh, mm -hmm. exciting <laughs> quality. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And also scorched stuff, like, mm -hmm. it, it look very sad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this kind of, yeah, this uh, is so different. You know? yeah. But the subtlety of what you were going for and the online presence of these works, I feel like, is... Maybe it's a natural thing of setting on fire. So. Yeah. But actually, yeah. what the viewer is confronted with is always this. I mean, it's again yeah. the, the, yeah. the moment where the piece burns is not public, and then <coughs> the space in which the video can be watched is very small. It's not like a room with a large projector. Mm -hmm. It's like a, this size projection, so it's really like a memory of a moment mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. has taken place. But uh, maybe one day we should make uh, large pictures of. He's burning. <laughs> uh, <coughs> can I make a kind of meta comment about the kind of how the conversation is happening that like, will lead, lead to a question, sure. which is um, just to acknowledge both forms of labor that are happening here. Right? <laughs> I know. You know I'm I'm really, like, uh, I don't know. Hold the yeah, I know. So, <laughs> just to it, you know put it on the table that you're both here and you're a collective, and there's yeah. also a child who's being cared for. It's very adorable, by the way. Um, and then I'm I'm always really curious about the logistics of collaboration, the, the really the nitty gritty of process. So I'd love to hear you speak a little bit more about how it functions between the two of you. Well, I usually do the talking, so it's not. I mean, that's why James is doing the thing. But I love that you're here also in front of us. I think this is like for me. I, there's I something kind of, really nice about yeah, it. Yeah, I I live the human style. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but this is labor. I mean, they're working. <laughs> yeah, totally, uh, uh, well, yeah, usually it doesn't do anything during the talk, so maybe that's... But in terms evidence. of formulating the, uh, your work, you know? Yeah, no, no, it's, it's just a, a moment. Of course, it, it, it's... Uh, a, well, we, we share all the tasks, and, uh, and it's... Uh, uh, and we scream at each other while we start an exhibition, and it's uh, a very conflictual thing. And, uh, and uh, yeah, and that's uh, essentially what well, is visible of our collaboration uh, from outside. But uh, uh, I, I don't know, I think just uh, once uh, one has uh, experienced uh, the intensity and the and, uh, fertility of a collaboration of working with other people, uh, it's very addictive. It's very hard to go back to working uh, on your own. So uh, we are both uh, convinced that um, this uh, makes us better artists and, and it makes the work stronger because uh, it's, it's extremely easy as an artist to come up with ideas uh, 
one thing that are good because it's very idiosyncratic and you to one subjectivity and taste and whatever. Uh, and then when, when one works with somebody else, uh, if the idea is not good, one gets polarized and destroyed. So that's mm -hmm. very, very, very good for, for, the, for the work. Uh, it limits the, the, yeah, the damage that one can do as an artist, uh, I, I would say. I don't know if it's a satisfactory answer. Yeah, it's a good answer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm sure that people have questions mm -hmm. or comments. Well, it's one of the things about the, the labor. I was, I can't help but think about the, the redemption center for the, the bottles and the people who did the labor of collecting them. And then the, the fire department, the firemen who came. And so there's something about the, this relationship between the inside, which is you know, the, the production and exhibition of art and those discourses, and then the way in which there's sort of an outside, in which there's all sorts of labor that is taking place that somehow is activated by the art in some way, but yet, uh, it's a kind of um, um, detritus or something that sort of exists, that, that sort of impinges in some way, but is not really uh, uh, part of it. And, and so I, Unless you decide that it actually was part of it after all. Uh, um, I don't think it was. Uh, I think, yeah, I mean, there is, uh, there is definitely um, uh, a machine, a uh, productive machine within society, a productive machine uh, also um, it doesn't go to sleep when one makes art. So uh, one is producing within a, a generally uh, productive and repressive context. So uh, inevitably what one does uh, takes place in, in, in a space where yeah, people are getting paid a certain amount of money per hour to put this can in a bag and I don't know if they really like that project in the end and, uh, and some cans were uh, rotten and they came from a terrible place and they had needles in them and so we had to say that we didn't want people to, to use these cans because it was dangerous for them etc. Et there are all these dimensions. Uh, of, of the world that, uh, that, that essentially bring back the body, I would say. It's, it's a very important aspect for us, although it's not so present in, in, the, uh, in the representation, in the, in the imagery of our work. The body is, al is always there uh, in, the, in the way we, uh, we relate to the, to the work and we conceive the work. So I would say that yeah, the firemen are, uh, are there to, to, to protect the safety of human bodies and spaces and then the material uh, reaction to the smoke. <laughs> <laughs>